Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome back. This is the program for today. I'll say just a few things about the presentations from Tuesday so that we can connect them to today's presentation about the future of the automobile, which includes an overview of the history of the development of this technology. However, I'm not going to go through every section, every detail. I don't need to do that. You can simply go back to last year's YouTube video with this lecture where I offered a 45 minutes review of the contents of the presentation on the future of the automobile. I will just focus on some of the major themes. In re I'll, I'll have some things to say in reference to the first part of the history of the automobile until the end of the 20th century, and a little bit to say about the future of the automobile. This way, we'll have enough time to watch the second and last segment from the movie The Love Bug to see the evolution of the character of Jim, the driver, and how his interactions with the people around him, his close friend, the artist slash mechanic, Tennessee, and his new friend slash love interest, Carol, develop after his or in parallel with the development of his relationship, so to speak, and interactions with Herbie, the little car. Uh, and I hope there will be some time at the end to exchange some ideas about this. First, I want to show you some of the announcements you find in the announcements page. As usual, yesterday uh, I posted a YouTube video of my third lecture. I'm not going to announce every time I post a video. You, just can, you can just count that usually within 24 hours. Worst case scenario, if I have a busy week at the Center for Italian Studies, by the end of the week, you will find videos of the classes so that if you miss a class or a portion of a class, you can review it. If you added late to the class, if you were not here last week or, God forbid, you, you missed three uh, of, of the first four classes, go back, watch those videos, take notes, come to me with questions. You can schedule a meeting on Zoom. I'm seeing students on Zoom in the morning before I go to the office, 8.30 to 9.30. And there is a, if you go to the calendar, there is a link to an app, Calendly, where you can schedule a meeting by yourself without having to exchange emails with me. Or you can come and visit me during office hours every, every, after every lecture from 3.30 until 5 on the fourth floor of the library, E4340. So the next announcement is about the Concorso d'Eleganza. This is not my initiative. As you saw, uh, the, the next one will be the 18th annual Concorso d'Eleganza, a tradition initiated by the founder of the Center for Italian Studies, Mario Mignone, in collaboration with a Stony Brook professor, Robert D. Sess, who had a small collection of cars, including an Alfa Romeo, and knew a lot of people with vintage cars. So on Sunday, September 15th, Sunday morning from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m., we'll have a car show with Italian cars in parking lot two, which is between Wang and Tubman Hall. If you are on campus, if you live nearby, Come and see the cars. We had some wonderful cars last year. And talk to the car owners who are usually eager to talk to you about the significance of their car in terms of design, manufacturing, technology, or ask them what this car means for them, how it makes them feel. Now, if you 
are ready for a more substantial commitment, we're still looking for volunteers. And up to three points of extra credit added to the final grade are available. Up to three, because it depends. You just have an hour or two, and that should be before 10 a.m., right? While we're getting the, the field ready, while the cars are coming in and the drivers need, need assistance, we need to place the cars according to a plan by, by brand, by history, etc. Or if you have more time, as I mentioned last year, I gave the full three points to an exceptional student, Brianna, who stayed from 7 a.m. until almost 2. Um, but as I said, it depends on the time you have available and otherwise just come for the experience, especially if you have never been to a car show. Of course, we, we don't charge any fee uh, from the public or the car owners. You find all the information, including some links, pictures from previous editions on the announcement page. And you can email me or you can come and talk to me after the class if you're thinking about this, if you have questions, if you would like to know more specifically what you can do to help. Don't forget that the first assignment is due tonight. The assignment should be posted inside a Google Docs file that was shared individually by me with every student. And if you have any questions about the assignment, you can, preferably before midnight tonight, post comments where you can just say, can you review this paragraph or this assignment and tell me if I interpreted the instructions correctly or ask me other questions because those comments that you place in the Google Docs file will translate into notifications that get to my inbox. Uh, yes, um, your name is Arvio. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Not necessarily. It's up to you. It doesn't have to be formal. I reviewed with you last week the assignment, the, the instructions that you have here. But the core of this assignment, what makes it successful, is how good your examples are, right? The theme is, have cars lost their magic? And the ideal assignment should bring examples and counterexamples. What does it mean? car magic to me and the example could be I used to watch Speed Racer or I used to play Forza Motorsport uh, or other video games on my Xbox or my uh, or Gran Turismo on uh, um, so the Sony PlayStation right and how, how did that make you feel playing with those cars was there a car in particular that you fantasized about because of the game, right? This could be one of a few examples you could bring to support the idea that cars still retain some of the original magic. Counter examples could be, well, professors, I don't have a driver's license or my sister, my friends don't have a driver's license. They didn't go right away uh, on their 16th birthday to take their uh, driver's uh, uh, test. Since I immigrated to this country in, in 94, for whatever reason, the US did not accept my Italian driver's license. I had to take the test and, and then the, the, the driving uh, exam. So I remember that there were people in 94 taking the test with me who were barely 16 right, who had just had their birthday, they were eager to get a license. So think of examples and counterexamples that either belong to your life, to your memory, to the memories of your family, or examples you see around you, your inner circle of friends and relatives, or examples that you can find in the media. Try not to make this generic. It doesn't have to be long. So even just one example and one counterexample could be sufficient. Make this 
specific, not generic. Keep in mind that you don't need to research this, you don't need to Google this, you just need to sit down and reflect on this theme. And if you need some initial stimulation in order to prompt and, and prepare for, for the uh, assignment, go review the first two presentations. The general introduction with all the images, you can just scroll and, and find stuff that you can relate to, right? You, you see a few images about toys. Oh, okay. I could be talking about a toy car that I have that somebody gave to me and, or, or uh, that can be seen on display in my house because uh, my, my father, my grandfather played with it and there is a story attached to it that brings evidence to one of the branches of this argument. Car magic or... Cars have lost their magic. Uh, review the second presentation, the one entitled Core Concepts, because there are two. There are many ideas, even if you quickly review it, you can find many ideas, meaning that you can see what could be relevant for this. Okay? And, and just do your best. Keep in mind that we'll have only four or five of these assignments and they will be distributed more or less evenly during the first half of the semester because by mid-October I want you to focus just on the readings in preparation for the final exam and on your final project which will be introduced during the first or the second week in October when there will be two classes where we talk about the final exam, we review the page for the final project, we review the page for the final project, we do some activities in class to make sure you understand what the project is about. Okay? Other questions about the assignment. And of course, be professional. If you cannot complete the assignment because, let's say, you just add it to the class, or you have a family engagement and you would like to have one more day, two more days, let me know before the deadline, okay? Just send, take the time to send a polite email asking for a short extension, given a, a, a simple justification, okay? It's not the end of the world for me uh, and uh, a short extension can be Granted, of course, I don't expect you to be asking extensions every single time, right? That wouldn't be so professional, but it's part of life, right? Uh, some courses have such uh, fixed deadlines enforced so brutally that they seem to be disconnected from the real world, where even in an office environment faced with humongous projects, you sometimes need to ask for extensions, right? Okay, in any case... Uh, there is an alternative assignment. Keep in mind that it's just either this, have cars lost their magic with these instructions, or the other, not both, okay? The other, if you're comfortable, if you prefer, is based on a short film on a serpentine road with the top down, as you can see, is a little more than 30 minutes long. Can be found streaming on uh, Amazon. And in this case, the theme is similar, the magic of the car. But all the examples you bring into the assignment, which again can be just a couple of scenes, two or three scenes at the most, because it's a short assignment, should be select scenes, sequences in this film that demonstrate what is the magic of the car for the protagonist of this film. As I mentioned, uh, the uh, female protagonist has kept an old British car, tremendously unreliable, Triumph Stag, I believe it's called. There is information on the website. Because that was the car where that she was using when she first fell in love and married a man who later died. And even though she has a new partner, a new family, 
she feels this particular peculiar attachment to the car because when she drives around, she can reach down inside and, and find things about herself, find what that period in her life signified, meant for her, and where that experience from those years led her, meaning she became the woman she is because of that period, and the car is one way to work on herself. And this is a theme we'll find in plenty of films. It's marginal in Herbie the Loved Back, but it's a prominent theme in Bumblebee, in the horror movie Christine, where working on the car is a metaphor for working on the self. And the more you work on the car, and the more you change and transform yourself, your identity, etc. And some of that is present here. I find this a, a great short movie. It's moving, literally. Uh, but again, it's just an alternative. And as I said, especially if you've done film classes and you're comfortable with film analysis, but otherwise, just watch the movie. See if you can work with it. If you find examples, you can unpack because, as I said, you don't need to analyze everything in the film. You just need to bring good examples that show the magic of the car in this film. Okay? And next week there will be another assignment due. So I'll talk about this in detail on Tuesday. This is due Friday of next week. It's called Old Cars, New Cars. How do they feel? Or I could have written... How do they make you feel? And the idea is to go to one of four recommended YouTube channels and finding, following what YouTubers do say, what they say about the experience of the car when they tried a special car, uh, an exotic car, a sports car, an old car. And again, it's about the analysis of their language or body language and what evidence brings to this idea that the car is a technology that you feel, not just experience, but that makes you feel in a certain way. And therefore, if this is true, then the car is one of those modern technologies that go beyond the utilitarian function, right? It's not just about transportation, not about going from point A to point B, because everything these YouTubers, some of whom have large number of followers, try to convey this idea that this experience is so special, so unique. Okay? And in fact, I recommend that you pick either Autofocus with Marcus Brownlee, Nicole Johnson's YouTube channel. She doesn't produce too many videos, but they're all extraordinary. Or Shmi 150 who's very quirky, sometimes a bit cringy, but unique as a YouTuber, and again, with a big follow-up. Those would, should be your preferences, because Jay Leno, which has a humongous collection of videos, usually at the beginning of the video, goes through a long introduction, going through all the technical details in the car, but you don't need that for the assignment. You just need... The last part, where he goes on the road with the car. And again, focus on how does this particular car make Jay Leno feel? And how does he convey those feelings? What kind of language? Or, as I said, it could be body language. This is especially true for, for Shmi, who's, who's very uh, communicative. Um, it's, it's like a child around cars. Okay, so let's go back to what we were doing on Tuesday. We talked about the history of mobility. We looked at some early examples of vehicles, self-propelled vehicles, and discussed whether or not we can consider them the ancestors of the car. And you find here the most egregious example the automobile by Leonardo, which in fact was just a 
movie, uh, uh, or not a movie prop, a theater prop, uh, something that was used on stage, never meant to go on a road. And believe me, if Leonardo had thought that he could use this on the road, he would have tried to sell the idea to one of his patrons because he was not the kind of inventor or artist that did it for the glory. He was trying to make, become rich, which is true of other artists. For example, Michelangelo, who lived longer than Leonardo by the end of his life, was a millionaire in today's terms. So the conclusion for us was nothing that you find before the 1880s comes even closer, uh, close to our automobiles, okay? Because in order to come up with a full automobile, you need many different machines, many different components, many different inventions and advancements in various fields that came together to make the first automobile possible only from the 1880s on. At the same time, when we looked at energy sources and models, instruments for transportations used in the past, we find confirmation of the same idea because practically for 3,000 years, perhaps even longer, more or less the same means of transportation dominated societies around the world, relying on the same modalities and the same sources of energies. Human and humans and animals, which in fact were used for 50 or more years after the introduction of the automobile, and ships. Within society, humans and animals were dominant, and in terms of strategic power, the power that can, the technology whose power can make or break an empire, it's every time from a, from a millennium to the next ships, right? The Romans became an empire when they became, when they, they started to, to work, uh, deploy a fleet and became good at that, although they, they almost lost uh, their, their uh, war with the Carthaginians who were better at going at sea. Later on in the 19th century, of course, besides the um, automobile, the uh, steamships, steam trains were introduced, and then the bicycles. However, steamships and trains are not exactly in the same category in the technological spectrum as the car, because they're not individual technologies. You cannot own and operate a steamship or a train. And they don't make you feel. They don't produce this effect that goes beyond the utilitarian function of moving people or supplies from point A to point B like the car can do. As I said before, the presentation about the future of the automobile starts with a review. Uh, let me show you again. Uh, there are various sections. I, I've included 20 to 40 years in each segment explaining what is that happens in the field of automotive technology. Not that you have to learn, memorize, regurgitate in the exam these details, but so that you have an idea whether you know something about cars or not, you have a general idea of technological trends and developments, which are often also connected to social changes or historical events, such as World War I, World War II, etc. Right now, I will just, as I announced earlier, say a few things about a couple of periods. Just to say that the automobile began to be mass produced around 1907-1908. Okay, so we'll not focus really on the 1880s or 1890s in this class because we're interested in 
the car and culture, the car and society. During the first 15, 20 years, the car was just a toy for wealthy people. It was unreliable, could not be used daily and for uh, extensive periods of times, of, of hours, right? Because within the first 50 to 100 miles, any car would break down in one way or the other. If, if nothing else, you would have a flat tire, right? Because of the conditions of the dirt roads, which had a lot of debris, rocks, and anything else that could fall from a carriage. Because when you have a carriage with crude suspensions and wooden wheel, all sorts of things will fall on the pavement. 1907, 1908 is when cars go from thousands of models sold, thousands of cars, vehicles sold, to hundreds of thousands and later on millions of cars. And through the 20th century, the technical development of the car continued. We can say that by the 1990s, the car, the automobile as a technology, was perfected. Not that there wasn't any innovation following that, or possible innovations, but in our century, really, the only partial innovation is electrical cars. I'm calling it a partial innovation because, of course, we know from the initial presentation on Tuesday that 100 or more years ago, electrical cars already represented a third of the circulating vehicles, okay? And then the industry moved away from that technology, which from the very beginning was recognized to be the easiest to operate and maintain, okay? So electrical cars were being sold to doctors so that they could reliably get to their patients in rural areas. They were being sold to women saying, look, it's so simple. Because of course you remember how uh, antique cars have a handle and you need to crank the engine. But the handle is, is finicky. If you don't do it correctly, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you can break a finger. Because when the engine takes, the, the handle will uh, uh, kick back. So you have to turn it and let it go. And if the motor, the engine hasn't started, you do it again. But the reason why people suggested that women should not be cranking their cars is different and has to do with the way a woman is supposed to behave in public, which includes posture. And in order to crank the car, you have to bend down and assume a position that was deemed to be unbecoming for women, especially upper class women. So here it is, the electric car. It starts easily. It, it is easy to operate, not having all the moving parts. It doesn't break as often. So all the advantages were there, including, as I said, the, this idea that instead of just recharging the car at home, which they did, you can, if you have a facility, replace the battery and just go. Go to someone who has a charged battery, put it on, connect the wires, and continue. Okay? So this century is not about technical innovations. Other than the electrical car, even hybrid cars cannot be considered different substantially. But why is it that we don't have technical innovations? That is it true that there is nothing more to be done with cars? By the end of the 20th century, cars were very efficient and reliable as well. They were easy enough to produce. Cars by the end of the 20th century were not as expensive as they are now, with some exceptions, the United States being one, or a partial exceptions, because other areas of the world, especially Europe, have a lot, had a lot more small cars. 
Asia, especially Japan, had plenty of small and some of the smallest cars, cheaper as well. But by the 1990s, cars were easy to produce, easy enough to maintain for a mechanic and for the users. When I came to Stony Brook in 94, I still found students, boys and girls, who changed their brakes, changed their spark plugs, because somebody in their family taught them how to do. Go find someone, a peer in your community that is able to do that, right? We're at the point in the history of the use of the automobile where automobiles don't even have, for the most, a spare tire, right? For the very reason that no one wants or is able to change a tire, right? When, when I grew up in Italy, everybody had to change a tire sooner or later. And you would help your father or your mother learn how to do it and then do it yourself, right? Nowadays, if you have a flat tire, you call a friend or you call AAA, you don't take care of that. It was different up to the end of the 20th century. In terms of efficiency, the cars from that time were quick enough. Of course, some of them were not as quick, right? Even a Ferrari from that era is nothing compared to some of the, the cars available today. And I'm not talking about exotic cars or sports cars, even cars uh, $30,000 to $50,000. Um, the cars from the 20th century were quick enough. A lot of cars from the end of the 20th century were able to get to 40 miles per gallon or above. So very efficient in terms of consumption, which makes you think, is the Green Deal really about saving nature or is just another way to sell big, fast, expensive cars? Because if you were there at, at 40 miles per hour, 40 miles per gallon with internal combustion engine, imagine what you could do continuing the, the work on that. Cars from the 1980s and 90s could easily be used for 20 years sometimes more, right? Europe, both Western and Eastern Europe, is full of cars that are 20 years old or more that are still used daily. They're not considered vintage cars. They're used by people. And you can still buy them for $1,000, $2,000. And if you have a mechanic that will check, make sure that they're well maintained, you can use them daily. Imagine this kind of, of world. Of course, cars that are 10 years old are almost as expensive in Europe as they are in here. I'm talking about the brave customer who will say, I don't mind this car is sold because I know it's reliable. Today's cars, even the best cars, even the Mercedes or the BMWs or the Asian brands will rarely last past the 10 years of, of use. Not that they cannot be fixed, but once you get to around 10 years of regular use, repairs will become so expensive, especially in a place such as the United States, that you'll be motivated to get rid of those cars. And of course, some of those cars will end up into secondary and tertiary markets, right? South America, Africa, some places in the Middle East, etc., where the wages of mechanics, the hourly wages are lower, and therefore those cars can be fixed. But otherwise, by year 10 or 11, your expensive BMW or, or Ford, etc., will have at least a sensor that fails. You cannot pass the inspection, and in order to fix that sensor, you have to take the engine apart, and the bill will be in the thousands of dollars. At the point you say, well, it's not worth it. As I said, the question would be, why no 
big innovations in our centuries for cars simply because they're not needed to sell the car not that they couldn't innovate things but they're not selling the cars by saying as they did in the 20th century buy this car because it's newer because it's different from the competition these days the cars you find within the same segment right small utility vehicles off-roads uh, mid uh, level sedans luxury suvs etc within the same segment the cars are almost identical technically and in terms of optionals accessories experience even they're very close to each other you're not really buying anything new it's your preference and everything is done through marketing and the marketing to sell the cars receives a huge amount of dollars right in order to sell the, the, the cost of the car within the cost of the car marketing accounts for a big chunk a bigger chunk nowadays than it used to be and marketing drives engineering so when you go buy a car that is not so expensive they intentionally made it just barely adequate so that when you drive it it's comfortable but barely comfortable you can feel the road it's quick but barely quick enough so that you as a customer will have access to the company selling that car with a low cost vehicle but then you realize pretty soon that there is a big noticeable difference between that entry-level car and the next segment that will cost you five to ten thousand dollars more so you have to be motivated but keep in mind that it's all marketing that the engineers could have made that entry-level car as comfortable as quick as you want as equipped as you want with one or two thousand dollars more not ten thousand dollars more they do it intentionally they put cheap parts where they save only 50 cents let's say this part plaques which tend to be terrible in entry-level cars you save what 50 cents a dollar at best per spark plug they do it intentionally so that you'll be motivated to buy to become a continued customer going up the scale and buying more expensive cars of course both in the 20th century and in the 21st century cars are sold as lifestyle changers buy this car and look cool in it buy this car and go to places well the places you only see in commercials of cars right with the family going to a remote lake in the mountains to a beach having fun uh, or sleeping in the car sleeping in a van right having this experience of a lifetime that happened constantly however in the 20th century people knew that the next generation of cars would be technically different and more advanced now that's not the case as much uh, any longer right and talking about innovations think of the complete failure to meet the customer's expectations now that every customer has or every passenger on the car has a smartphone how painful it is to connect your smartphone to a car why don't can i can't i find a place to put my phone in my car and i have to buy a mount and i have to put it uh, somewhere but but it, it will fall right a standard mount for it for a phone is not found across the industry right and talking about innovations keep in mind tesla is the only new global company in the business in the last 60 to 7 years right everything that has happened is just merging of companies companies changing owners but nobody before elon musk was able to create a big company on a global scale 
because the industry was so stagnant and so resistant to change. The future looks like the past. What does it mean? It means that 100 or 120 years ago, what was the situation? Fewer than 10% of the people in the United States owned a car. The wealthiest or the people who needed professionally, right? It could be a farmer with a truck or a tractor. It could be a doctor, no matter how wealthy, because doctors from 100 years ago were not all wealthy. But if they had a rural practice, then they needed to visit their patients. The rest of the population was not cut out from the use of the technology. Because already 100 years ago, 120 years ago, you had taxi cabs, you had car rentals. You could rent a car just for an hour, with or without a driver. Very easy. You just called a garage or you walked into a garage and asked for if they had any car you could borrow, any uh, drivers they could call themselves to drive you around. And why is the future like this? Because electrification of the fleet of vehicles, of circulating vehicles, seems to be a given, right? Or a must. It will happen, there'll be legislation, some countries have moved up the deadline, 2030, 2035, 2050, but it seems like it's destined to happen. However, what are we seeing? We are seeing that in most places, especially in here, electric vehicles are sold as luxury cars. Where's the entry level electric cars? They keep promising you that, right? Tesla was supposed to do, make Tesla too. Volvo was supposed to, Introduce the EX, EX30 at $35,000. Promise for 2024, not here yet. And for the most part, it's not going to happen. Why? Because they don't want to market an entry-level car. Because it could be done. It's not, you just need to reduce the number of batteries, which is the most expensive component in the car. And convince people that in a family with four cars, they should have one big car for traveling together or long distances, and then three small electric cars to drive daily because your daily drive will be 20, 40, 100 miles. And 100 miles of batteries is not a lot. It's 300 miles with a huge car around you that makes the vehicle so costly. So if this is the future, unless there are some dramatic, radical changes, innovations in the technology of the batteries especially, the future is such that people who are desperate or for it or desperately want a car or are rich enough will have their own private vehicle. Most, the majority of the population will use a shared car an automated car, a kind of automated Uber, where you, from an app, you call the closest vehicle to come pick you up, take you to Stony Brook, and then the vehicle goes away to the next customer. And within urban areas, people rely on electric scooter and alternative forms of mobility, which is not entirely bad, but a bit weird because nobody's telling you the future is not you owning an electric vehicle. The future is some of you owning an electric vehicle and the, other, the others using alternative forms of transportation, right? Because after all, it's simple to see that this is not happening, that this is a failed revolution. If I asked you, on your way, if you're a commuter, on, and you drove to the campus, on your way to the university, how many stations did you find where someone can recharge an electric car, right? And at minimum, you have to think about it, right? Why is this not happening? And of course, you can, if you have an electric car, like I do, you can recharge it at home, but you want to have a place if there is an emergency to recharge your car on the road. 
Same with electric cars. Yes, you see electric cars around, but there is still a small percentage. We are nowhere near the 30% that of electric cars that existed 100 years ago. Okay? Um, and the only other thing that I want to say is the following. Don't believe, as sometimes you're led to believe by the marketing, that owning an electric car is about saving money. It could be about saving the planet, although, as I explained, production of an electric car has a bigger environmental impact than production of a regular car. So day one, you're in the red environmentally. It's only if you keep that car, and electric cars could go on for 10 or 20 years. I'm saying could because they're failing there as well because they want to add so much electronics to electric cars that they're looking for trouble, right? Why should I open the, the, the hatch to recharge my electric car from inside with a button on my screen? And there is no mechanical release. If that system fails, I'm stranded. But the mechanical release would be a spring that costs 50 cents. So anyway, um, don't believe that you'll save money. Of course, Tesla itself will tell you, buy this $45,000, $50,000 car because you'll save $5,000 in the next five years. Uh, you might be saving money one way or in the short term, but sooner or later you'll have to pay fees by the miles on your electric car. It's a simple math problem. How much money is being made by governments, US government, governments in Europe even, are even worse, Canada is worse than the United States, how much money is being made through taxes imposed on gasoline? So do you think the government, if everyone switches or big numbers of people switch to electric cars, will just forego of that money? No, already Oregon, other states are experimenting with the idea that since you, the owner of an electric car, are not paying taxes at a gas station because you just go bye-bye and don't stop there, you will have to pay 10 cents per mile or some other amount in taxes because those taxes that will tell you are going to pay for the paving of the roads, for the infrastructures, for the bridges. So, in the long term, electric cars will not be saving you money because you'll save on gas, but you'll have some additional fee to pay. Okay, so that was the end of the first part of the presentation, and now I want to switch to the film. But before I do, any questions, any comments on, on the future of the automobile? Any ideas? And feel free to contradict. I mean, this is my view, but there are plenty of experts who have different views or better experts. Um, um, how much does it cost to get the, the car battery charger installed to your house? Not very expensive. I spent seven or eight hundred dollars including installation and installation included taking a 200 volt wire from a distant point in the house where the main panel was to the garage. And uh, almost every year there are in New York rebates so you can have $500 back from the state for the installation. The state of New York promised time and time again five to $10,000 per electric pump. Co trying to convince restaurant owners, outlets, other commercial venues to install those pumps. Big failure, right? Because even, even when you go to, to various local malls, you find few or no uh, electric pumps there and it would be ideal right you know that you're going to the mall you'll spend an hour two hours there and you're recharging in the meantime you don't even know you don't even need uh, fast charging right to to get something back so the infrastructure is not there at least in the u.s which is has been vociferous about this revolution but it hasn't happened in europe the situation is different especially Northern Europe. Norway is the biggest exception. 
moving towards electrification in a big way. The infrastructure is there. You could recharge everywhere. In Italy, I've seen a few gas stations when I went in the summer that included an electric pump, which would be the, local, the, the logical thing to do, right? You know it's a station. It doesn't have to be the Tesla charging station. And you should go there. But keep in mind that how many cars can a regular gas station service in an hour? Hundreds. Big stations, even a thousand. How many cars can be serviced by a station with electrical pumps? 10, 20, 30, sometimes less than 10 if the cars are not fast charging, right? So you would need a bigger infrastructure. Thank you, Robert. Any other questions or comments? How many of you, out of curiosity, don't see yourself buying a car? would rather live in a place where you don't need a car if you if you could choose by by show of hands okay and everyone else instead is eager to buy a car or afraid of the financial impact any reactions how do you feel about ownership and expenses connected to ownership of a car tell me if i don't see Robert, would you like to say something? No, uh, I thought you. Yes. Um, sh sh Shadow. Um, my first car was a Saab. Which I was, it went out of, ran out of business. But it was, was it a Saab 900 or? Uh, it was a Saab 95. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. A famous model. Yeah. Uh, it was like a very, like, it was cool to drive, definitely, but it, it had like a turbo in it, but it was, it was so hard to maintain. Uh -huh. Not reliable. No, not reliable. I'm surprised. Yeah, but now, now I have a Honda Civic. That's very reliable. Uh -huh. so, as long as you have a reliable car, I feel like it's fine. I'm not too pleased about having well, to buy a car, but I'll do it anyway. Again, reliability for the first five years can be very high for some brands. And of yeah. course, Honda, it's usually the first or the second. Consumer Report published again. So... Um, Reliable cars from the past, companies from the past, such as Volvo, are now ranked 18th. Um, Teslas are ranked 25th or 24th, but Toyota and Honda are in the first five. Subaru is in the first five. However, reliability in the first five years is wonderful, tremendous. Reliability 10 to 15 years is the, the issue because even a small problem can become very costly. Okay, so... The, the precursor to the Saab 95, the Saab 900, was famously reliable with plenty of people driving it for 20 years, yeah. right? But it was a simpler car. Okay, so for, for this film, I included some notes under week two, and I'm just going to say a few things. You can review those notes yourself. So... While you're watching the film, and I'm going to ask you again if you have a few notes to write here on this page. Don't feel compelled to write two pages. Just a few sentences. Go for quality. Go for brilliance. Go for details that tell a lot. But keep this in mind for your notes. They shouldn't be descriptive notes. We're going to read this movie as a metaphor of the relationship with the car, interaction with the car, right? Based on the idea that the car is not a utilitarian technology, not about transportation. It's about how it makes you feel. Or in this case, in the case of Jim, the protagonist of the film, it's about working on yourself. How is Jim before he gets to drive Herbie? a failing driver and a failing man, a failing members of, member of society, right? Not a very mature individual, not very accomplished or respectful in his relationship with his friend Tennessee or his love interest Carol. Once he gets the car, the work on himself begins and the, the arc of the character is how does owning and operating the car change Jim? 
This should be your focus, right? And, and I suggest this, parado this paradox. The traditional technologies were seen as an extension of ourselves, our bodies, right? Traditional example, take a hammer. The hammer is an extension of my arm. But cars or smartphones become, in this case, the user become an extension of the technology. Why? Because without you, the technology cannot go beyond its purpose. When the smartphone was invented, or, or the mobile phones earlier in the 20th century, did people ever think that it would become a primary instrument for connecting people, hooking up, find a, finding a partner? No, right? It's the combination of the technology with the user that expands the range of functions of the technology. Okay, so it's the other way around. Um, and, of course, keep in mind, Disney, especially at that time, was not only family-oriented, but very conservative. These films are also moralistic. They reflect a traditional morality. So the idea is that Jim, at the beginning of the story, is nothing because he believes he's a strong man with leadership in his profession, in the sports, in social life. By the end of the film, he has come to realize that he is not, cannot be the man he has become without his car, his friend Tennessee, his love, Carol, right? And just by moving away from his arrogant, presumptuous individualism that he becomes successful in racing, in social life, in his relationship, etc. Right? When he understands that he needs the help from these components, the technology, Herbie, society, his friend Tennessee, uh, and his partner, uh, Carol. 